California Gold Rush from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. The California Gold Rush began on January 24, 1848, when gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill in Coloma, California. News of the discovery soon spread, resulting in 300,000 people coming to California from the rest of the United States and abroad. These early gold seekers, called 49ers, traveled to California by sailing ship and in covered wagons across the continent, often facing substantial hardship. While most of the newly arrived were Americans, the gold rush attracted tens of thousands from Latin America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. At first, the prospectors retrieved the gold from streams and riverbeds using simple techniques such as panning, and later developed more sophisticated methods that were adopted around the world. Gold, worth billions of today's dollars, was recovered, leading to great wealth for a few. Many, however, returned home with little more than they started with. The effects of the gold rush were substantial. San Francisco grew from a hamlet of tents to a boom town, and roads, churches, schools, and other towns were built. A system of laws and a government were created, leading to the admission of California as a state in 1850. New methods of transportation developed as steamships came into service and railroads were built. The business of agriculture, California's next major growth field, started on a wide scale throughout the state. However, the gold rush also had negative effects. Native Americans were attacked and pushed off traditional lands and gold mining caused environmental harm. Section 1 Overview The gold rush started at Sutter's Mill near Coloma. On January 24, 1848, James W. Marshall, a foreman working for Sacramento pioneer John Sutter, found pieces of shiny metal in the tail race of a lumber mill Marshall was building for Sutter along the American River. Marshall quietly brought what he found to Sutter, and the two of them privately tested the findings. The test showed Marshall's particles to be gold. Sutter was dismayed by this and wanted to keep the news quiet because he feared what would happen to his plans for an agricultural empire if there were a mass search for gold. However, rumors soon started to spread and were confirmed in March 1848 by San Francisco newspaper publisher and merchant Samuel Brannan. The most famous quote of the California Gold Rush was by Brannan. After he had hurriedly set up a store to sell gold prospecting supplies, Brannan strode through the streets of San Francisco, holding aloft a vial of gold, shouting, Gold! Gold! Gold from the American River! On August 19, 1848, the New York Herald was the first major newspaper on the East Coast to report there was a gold rush in California. On December 5th, President James Polk confirmed the discovery of gold in an address to Congress. Soon, waves of immigrants from around the world, later called the 49ers, invaded the gold country of California, or Motherlode. As Sutter had feared, he was ruined. His workers left in search of gold and squatters invaded his land and stole his crops and cattle. San Francisco had been a tiny settlement before the rush. When residents learned of the discovery, it became a ghost town of abandoned ships and businesses 
whose owners joined the gold rush, but then boomed as merchants and new people arrived. The population exploded from perhaps 1,000 in 1848 to 25,000 full-time residents by 1850. As with many boom towns, the sudden influx strained the infrastructure of San Francisco and other towns near the gold fields. People lived in tents, wood shanties, or deck cabins removed from abandoned ships. In what has been referred to as the first world-class gold rush, there was no easy way to get to California. Forty-niners faced hardship and often death on the way. At first, most Argonauts, as they were also known, traveled by sea. From the East Coast, a sailing voyage around the tip of South America would take five to eight months and cover some 18,000 nautical miles. An alternative was to sail to the Atlantic side of the Isthmus of Panama to take canoes and mules for a week through the jungle and then on the Pacific side to wait for a ship sailing for San Francisco. There was also a route across Mexico starting at Veracruz. Eventually, most gold seekers took the overland route across the continental United States, particularly along the California Trail. Each of these routes had its own deadly hazards, from shipwreck to typhoid fever and cholera. To meet the demands of the arrivals, ships bearing goods from around the world, porcelain and silk from China, ale from Scotland, sailed into San Francisco as well. Upon reaching San Francisco, ship captains found that their crews deserted and went to the gold fields. The wharves and docks of San Francisco became a forest of masts as hundreds of ships were abandoned. San Franciscans turned the abandoned ships into warehouses, stores, taverns, hotels, and one into a jail. Many of these ships were later destroyed and used for landfill to create more buildable land in the boomtown. Within a few years, there was an important but lesser-known surge of prospectors into far northern California, specifically into present-day Siskiyou, Shasta, and Trinity counties. Discovery of gold nuggets at the site of present-day Wairika in 1851 brought thousands of gold seekers up the Siskiyou Trail and throughout California's northern counties. Settlements of the Gold Rush era, such as Portuguese Flat on the Sacramento River, sprang into existence and then faded. The Gold Rush town of Weaverville on the Trinity River today retains the oldest continuously used Taoist temple in California a legacy of Chinese miners who came. While there are not many Gold Rush era ghost towns still in existence, the well-preserved remains of the once bustling town of Shasta is a California State Historic Park in Northern California. Gold was also discovered in Southern California, but on a smaller scale. The first discovery at Rancho San Francisco, in the mountains north of present-day Los Angeles, had been in 1842, six years before Marshall's discovery, while California was still a part of Mexico. However, these first deposits and later discoveries in Southern California mountains attracted little notice and were of limited consequence economically. By 1850, most of the easily accessible gold had been collected, and attention turned to more difficult locations. Faced with gold increasingly difficult to retrieve, Americans began to drive out foreigners to get at the most accessible gold 
that remained. The new California State Legislature passed a foreign miners' tax of twenty dollars per month, and American prospectors began a tax on foreign miners, particularly Latin Americans and Chinese. In addition, the huge numbers of newcomers were driving Native Americans out of their traditional hunting, fishing, and food gathering areas. To protect their homes and livelihood, some Native Americans responded by attacking the miners. This provoked counterattacks on Native villages. The Native Americans, outgunned, were often slaughtered. Those who escaped massacres were many times unable to survive without access to their food gathering areas, and they starved to death. Novelist and poet Joaquin Miller vividly captured one such attack in his semi autobiographical work, Life Amongst the Modocs. Word of the gold rush spread slowly at first. The earliest gold seekers to arrive in California during 1848 were people who lived near California or people who heard the news from ships on the fastest sailing routes from California. The first large group of Americans to arrive were several thousand Oregonians who came down to the Siskiyou Trail. Next came people from Hawaii by ship and several thousand Latin Americans, including people from Mexico, from Peru, and from as far away as Chile, both by ship and overland. By the end of 1848, some 6,000 Argonauts had come to California. Only a small number, probably fewer than 500, traveled overland from the United States that year. Some of these 48ers, as these very earliest gold seekers were also sometimes called, were able to collect large amounts of easily accessible gold, in some cases thousands of dollars worth each day. Even ordinary prospectors averaged daily gold finds worth 10 to 15 times the daily wage of a laborer on the East Coast. A person could work for six months in the gold fields and find the equivalent of six years' wages back home. By the beginning of 1849, word of the gold rush has spread around the world, and an overwhelming number of gold seekers and merchants began to arrive from virtually every continent. The largest group of 49ers in 1849 were Americans, arriving by the tens of thousands overland across the continent and along various sailing routes. The name 49er was derived from the year 1849. Australians and New Zealanders picked up the news from ships carrying Hawaiian newspapers and thousands infected with gold fever boarded ships for California. Forty-niners came from Latin America, particularly from the Mexican mining districts near Sonora. Gold seekers and merchants from Asia, primarily from China, began arriving in 1849, at first in modest numbers, to Gold Mountain, the name given to California in Chinese. The first immigrants from Europe, reeling from the effects of the revolutions of 1848 and with a longer distance to travel, began arriving in late 1849, mostly from France, with some Germans, Italians, and Britons. It is estimated that almost 90,000 people arrived in California in 1849, about half by land and half by sea. Of these, perhaps 50,000 to 60,000 were Americans, and the rest were from other countries. By 1855, 
it is estimated at least three hundred thousand gold seekers merchants and other immigrants had arrived in california from around the world the largest group continued to be americans but there were tens of thousands each of mexicans chinese britons french and latin americans together with many smaller groups of miners such as filipinos basques and turks a modest number of miners of african ancestry probably less than four thousand had come from the southern states the caribbean and brazil section two legal rights when the gold rush began california was a peculiarly lawless place on the day when gold was discovered at sutter's mill California was still technically part of Mexico, under American military occupation as the result of the Mexican-American War. With the signing of the treaty ending the war on February 2, 1848, California became a possession of the United States, but it was not a formal territory and did not become a state until September 9th 1850. California existed in the unusual condition of a region under military control. There was no civil legislature, executive or judicial body for the entire region. Local residents operated under a confusing and changing mixture of Mexican rules, American principles, and personal dictates. While the treaty ending the Mexican-American War obliged the United States to honor Mexican land grants, almost all of the gold fields were outside those grants. Instead, the gold fields were primarily on public land, meaning land formally owned by the United States government. However, there were no legal rules yet in place and no practical enforcement mechanisms. The benefit to the 49ers was that the gold was simply free for the taking. In the gold fields, there was no private property, no licensing fees, and no taxes. The 49ers resorted to making up their own codes and setting up their own local enforcement. The miners essentially adopted Mexican mining law existing in California. For example, the rules attempted to balance the rights of early arrivers at a site with later arrivers. A claim could be staked by a prospector, but that claim was valid only as long as it was being actively worked. Miners worked at a claim only long enough to determine its potential. If a claim was deemed as low value, as most were, miners would abandon the site in search for legendary bonanza sites. In the case where a claim was abandoned or not worked upon, other miners would claim jump the land. Claim jumping means that a miner began work on a previously claimed site. Disputes were sometimes handled personally and violently, and were sometimes addressed by groups of prospectors acting as arbitrators. The rules of mining claims adopted by the 49ers spread with each new mining rush throughout the western United States. The U.S. Congress finally legalized the practice in the Chafee Laws of 1866. Section 3. Development of Gold Recovery Techniques Because the gold in the California gravel beds was so richly concentrated, the early 49ers simply panned for gold in California's rivers and streams, a form of placer mining. However, 
panning cannot be done on a large scale and industrious miners and groups of miners graduated to placer mining cradles and rockers or long toms to process larger volumes of gravel in the most complex placer mining groups of prospectors would divert the water from an entire river into a sluice alongside the river and then dig for gold in the newly exposed river bottom modern estimates by the u s geological survey are that some twelve million ounces of gold were removed in the first five years of the gold rush worth approximately seven billion dollars u s at november two thousand six prices in the next stage by eighteen fifty three hydraulic mining was used on ancient gold-bearing gravel beds that were on hillsides and bluffs in the gold fields in hydraulic mining which was widely used in california at this time a high pressure hose directs a powerful stream or jet of water at gold-bearing gravel beds the loosened gravel and gold then pass over sluices with the gold settling to the bottom where it is collected by the mid eighteen eighties it is estimated that eleven million ounces of gold worth approximately six point six billion dollars u s at november two thousand six prices had been recovered via hydraulicing a by-product of this method of extraction was that large amounts of gravel and silt in addition to heavy metals and other pollutants went into streams and rivers many areas still bear the scars of hydraulic mining since the resulting exposed earth and downstream gravel deposits are unable to support plant life after the gold rush had concluded gold recovery operations continued the final stage to recover loose gold was to prospect for gold that had slowly washed down into the flat river bottoms and sandbars of california's central valley and other gold-bearing areas of california such as scott valley in siskiyou county by the late eighteen nineties dredging technology which was also invented in california had become economical and it is estimated that more than twenty million ounces were recovered by dredging worth approximately twelve billion dollars u s at november two thousand six prices both during the gold rush and in the decades that followed gold seekers also engaged in hard rock mining that is extracting the gold directly from the rock that contained it typically quartz usually by digging and blasting to follow and remove veins of the gold bearing quartz once the gold bearing rocks were brought to the surface the rocks were crushed and the gold was separated out using moving water or leached out typically by using arsenic or mercury another source of environmental contamination eventually hard rock mining wound up being the single largest source of gold produced in the gold country section four profits although the conventional wisdom is that merchants made more money than miners during the gold rush the reality is perhaps more complex there were certainly merchants who profited handsomely the wealthiest man in california during the early years of the gold rush was samuel brannan the tireless self-promoter shopkeeper and newspaper publisher Brannan alertly opened the first supply stores in Sacramento, Coloma, and other spots in the gold fields. 
just as the gold rush began he purchased all the prospecting supplies available in san francisco and resold them at a substantial profit however substantial money was made by gold seekers as well for example within a few months one small group of prospectors working on the feather river in eighteen forty eight retrieved a sum of gold worth more than one point five million dollars by two thousand six prices on average many early gold seekers did perhaps make a modest profit after all expenses were taken into account most however especially those arriving later made little or wound up losing money similarly many unlucky merchants set up in settlements that disappeared or were wiped out in one of the calamitous fires that swept the town springing up other businessmen through good fortune and hard work reaped great rewards in retail shipping entertainment lodging or transportation by eighteen fifty five the economic climate had changed dramatically gold could be retrieved profitably from the gold fields only by medium to large groups of workers either in partnerships or as employees by the mid eighteen fifties it was the owners of these gold mining companies who made the money also the population and economy of california had become large and diverse enough that money could be made in a wide variety of conventional businesses section four point one path of the gold once the gold was recovered there were many paths the gold itself took first much of the gold was used locally to purchase food supplies and lodgings for the miners these transactions often took place using the recently recovered gold carefully weighed out these merchants and vendors in turn used the gold to purchase supplies from ship captains or packers bringing goods to california the gold then left california aboard ships or mules to go to the makers of the goods from around the world a second path was the argonauts themselves who having personally acquired a sufficient amount sent the gold home or returned home taking with them their hard-earned diggings for example one estimate is that some eighty million dollars u s worth of california gold was sent to france by french prospectors and merchants as the gold rush progressed local banks and gold dealers issued banknotes or drafts locally accepted paper currency in exchange for gold and private mints created private gold coins with the building of the san francisco mint in eighteen fifty four gold bullion was turned into official united states gold coins for circulation the gold was also sent by california banks to u s national banks in exchange for national paper currency to be used in the booming california economy <laughs>